All right, welcome to all our friends tonight. We're going to do something fun tonight, a little questions and answers and recap what we went over last week, which was the Battle of Gog and Magog, the invasion of Israel by Russia, Turkey, Iran, and maybe Libya, uh, modern day Ethiopia. But we want to see about making our hearts ready for the return of the Lord. He, he could come at any time, and I think it's a purifying influence in our lives. So if you have questions, you can chime in or you're here in person, feel free to ask. Uh, but sorry, we didn't cover a lot of ground as far as questions last week. Um, but let's pray and we'll get started. Father, we thank you so much for your word. It's timeless. And because your word is life and truth, and because you created us to be your children and the body of Christ, given us all gifts, I pray that you would speak with power through your word, that you are welcome here, that you're welcome in our lives, and that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that the truth that you want to display and convict our hearts of tonight, remind us of tonight, that it would make us more like you and that it would bring more people into your kingdom. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this evening. Bless in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, if you aren't familiar with blueletterbible.org, I want to just give another plug for that. If you go to the website, uh, just kind of helpful. If whatever Bible passage you want to know more information about, um, what's nice is there are tools for every, every verse of the Bible and you can look up any translation. Uh, you're looking straight at word-for-word -word translations in many of these with the New King James, New American Standard, English Standard, where if you look at the Greek word and the English version of that, there's no, trans there's no transfer from multiple languages. It's straight from Greek to English. Um, there are some thought-for-thought -thought translations that are easy to read, like New Living and New International Version, which I would not study from, but you can read them and if they help you. But what I find fascinating is there are some tools here where you can look at inter interlinear, uh, where it kind of gives you an idea of what the verse looks like in the Hebrew, original Hebrew. You, you can look at the Strong's Concordance, and then you have different Bibles where you can look at multiple different translations of the same verse and without having to thumb through several different Bibles. Cross-references, we have the treasury of scripture knowledge where you can see what else the Bible has to say about the same passage. So it's helpful, like if... They're talking about a valley of dry bones. If you get to that point of this chapter, you may say, well, what, what other passages hint at that? And it'll be there for you. So if you don't have a center cross-reference on your Bible or you just want to dig deeper in the day and age that we live in, you have easy access. The other thing is commentaries. You obviously want to read the Bible for yourself, but the commentaries are nice because you can hear what pastors who've been pastoring for 30, 40, 50 plus years have learned as they've studied the scriptures. I've listened through the whole Bible with Chuck Smith. That's 365 hours from the late 80s. And uh, it was just insatiable. Like I was like, is this legal? Because it's just helpful to have someone walk you through. And many churches like the Calvary Chapel, some of us were a Baptist church, but you know, we teach verse by verse through the Bible because as we traverse or travel through, we hit every issue of life. And if you're like me, I need discipline, I need structure. When I am left to my own devices, like topical teaching, I'm not so good at. But if you're like, okay, next chapter, next week, that's what we'll pick up on in January. So just one more week, then we have two weeks off, and we'll pick up probably on a new, uh, new study midweek. Uh, but like I said before, we've gone through the whole New Testament in the last seven years. I keep getting Facebook memories that pop up when I went live a few years ago when I had no facial hair and I weighed 30 pounds less. But the idea being uh, when you go through it and you... If you want an archive teaching, what, what's the book of Ruth? I think we've talked through it twice. If you want to listen to any of the Gospels, we've talked through every chapter. If you want to listen to the Revelation study, I, I mean, like I said, that every week I'm just doing one chapter in the New Testament. So I try to put special attention and focus. So it wasn't verse by verse like where we're focusing on a chunk of three to five. We, we've, we've covered the whole chapter. So some of those chapters like John 15 has 58 verses. You know, that's a lot of ground to cover, but at least you know in this hour I'm going to go through a whole chapter. Uh, people like J. Vernon McGee, you know, they break it into, and through the word, they break it down into bite-sized pieces so you can listen to like two or three verses at a time. And he has a, a wonderful ministry. And I just, I love that the word of God, like Isaiah 55 says, it's like the water that, and the dew that rains down from heaven and it, it brings water to the seed and to the sower who plants a harvest, the word of God is like the seed that God plants and it's going to accomplish what he sets it forth to do. So for some of you, you're going back to college or you're raising grand, helping with grandkids or you're going to get married or you're raising kids or you're just in that season of life in your career where you need to have wisdom. And we've taught through the Proverbs and the Psalms and, and you hear that verse or you meditate on the word of God and he gives you what you need when you need it 
and you can be like a, a, a tree planted by waters that's yielding fruit. And if you submit to the Holy Spirit and you meditate on his word and it becomes your lifestyle, that's our desire here. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight a little bit. But as a quick recap, uh, if you're with us, I'm going to duplicate my screens here, I think. But Ezekiel 36, if you recall, um, let's scroll up here. There's one other thing. There's a Bible dictionary and then there's some maps here. So that may be helpful to you. But uh, if we go back to Ezekiel 36, 1. I'm going to close the tools here. There's a prophecy that's given to Ezekiel. And he says, So you of son of man, he says, prophesy to the mountains. And although they're desolate, if you think about Israel has been desolate for almost 2,000 years, about 1,900 years, um, and they're swallowed up on every side. Um, that happened. That's factual. Verse 3. We kind of hit on uh, verse 4. He, he's prophesying over the mountains of the Lord that they should hear the word of the Lord because of the mockery they've been plundered and the nations all around Israel have really wreaked havoc on the land. Uh, if we go all the way back down to verse 8, I don't want to rush too far, but just hit some of the highlights. You're going to yield fruit to my people Israel, for they are about to come, for indeed I am for you. I will turn. It says, I will turn to you and you shall be filled and sown. So what have we seen? I'm going to zoom in a little bit. What have we really seen since May 12th, 1948? Since World War II, we have seen just a few thousand people multiply into about seven to eight million Jews today in the land of Israel. There used to be more in New York City than the nation of Israel, but now they clearly outnumber in, in their homeland. They're the only people group that has been displaced for a good 2,000 years and still have their language, their culture, their customs, and their land that they started in. So a lot of people, right now, there's a very demonic force that wants to rip them out of their land, destroy them, eradicate them, kill them, death to Israel, death to the United States. That's what the Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran will say. But he says, I'm, I'm for you. There's a key point here. If God's for them and he has a promise that he's going to never rescind, and we read about that in Jeremiah, I believe 23, where he says, as long as there's sun, moon, and stars, I will never revoke or re rescind my promise. Israel will be a nation. He's never going to take the land away from them again. He's going to multiply on them the house of Israel. Um, shall be that the inhabit, it'll be inhabited and the ruins will be rebuilt. Remember Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain said, not even the cactus wants to grow in Israel. It's so bad. And uh, so we see that there's a blessing. In chapter 36, I'll cause men to walk on you. They will, uh, people were bereaved. Of, if you looked at how badly they were treated during the Holocaust, 7 million Jews were murdered. And a lot of Christians and a lot of Catholics, well, a lot of people that tried to harbor, harbor and help the the Jewish people. Uh, but there is going to be a renewal in the last days. And uh, we'll see where it actually says the last days. But he's going to pour out, pour out his fury on who? Well, he poured out his fury on the Israelites. Why? Because they worship false idols. He scattered them among the nations. And when they came to the nations, wherever they went, the people like scoffed at them. Oh, these are the Jews that got pulled out of Israel because they were wicked. And partially, I mean, that was true. But he had concern for his holy name. God does not want his name to be mocked. Just like Moses, when he wanted to kill all the people in the wilderness, he's like, God, do you want everybody to say that you just brought them out here to die? Let's remember your name. Remember your promises. And it said the Lord relented like Moses changed his mind. But really, God does not want anyone to perish, as Peter tells us in the New Testament. And he had concern for his holy name. The Lord is my shepherd. He, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Um, he leads me in paths of righteousness, what? For his name's sake. A lot of our sanctification process is so that God's name gets glorified more. So when you start kicking against the goes or the pricks or you keep doing things you know that God's not pleased with, you're really kind of uh, making him look bad, not necessarily just yourself. So just think about that. So he wanted to make himself and his promises exalted. And for his name's sake, he made a point. Have you ever punished a student, a child, a uh, co-worker because they're doing something wrong and you have to set a precedent. He set a precedent with his own people. He banished them out and he sent them to all the nations and he wanted them to be hallowed in their eyes or set apart, holy in their eyes. And then he was going to take them out from the nations and bring them back. And we've seen that. 
Uh, he sprinkled them with water. There are many Messianic Jews who put their faith in Jesus Christ. He'll give them a new heart. There, I've met many Messianic Jews, our, our tour guide for my tour in 2018 on Glenville Teachings. You can watch all the videos. His name was um, uh, Herzl, Eli Herzl, and he was a uh, born-again believer. He's born and raised as an Israeli. So there's many, many believers. So he's going to bring a purifying influence in these last days. He'll put his spirit in them. And he'll cause them to, like we are, we're filled with the Spirit of God. No one has to tell you, hey, obey the Lord, because you're obeying his law out of a good heart, clean heart, to keep his judgments and his statutes. And he says, you shall dwell uh, in the land that I gave your fathers. I will deliver you from uncleanness. I will multiply you, and you will remember your evil ways and deeds. Now, this is still in process. There's still a lot of Jews that are coming to faith. There will be Jews that come to faith during the tribulation. Many will die. Uh, there's 144,000 that are set apart during the tribulation. That's quite a mystery, but it's, it's been foreshadowed and prophesied. Um, they realize there's not a lot of Jews that went back to idolatry. They pretty much are either agnostic, atheistic, or orthodox Jews, or they become messianic believers in Jesus Christ, followers of the way, or what they say is completed Jews. They put their faith in Jesus. So it's awesome. Uh, let it be known to you, be ashamed, confounded in your own ways. Now, we just went through the whole book of Jeremiah, 52 chapters this year on Sunday mornings, and over and over and over, he says, you're going to be given over to pestilence, to the fire, and to the sword if you keep worshiping idols, and that was 70 years of Babylonian captivity. Ezekiel is writing toward the tail end of that, but he's prophesying about a day that would come yet future, and that's what we're seeing the fruit of today. Okay, I can't, where's my mouse? There we go. Then the Lord, uh, he said, on that day I will cleanse you from your iniquities. The desolate shall be filled. They will say this land was desolate. It's become like what? The Garden of Eden. If you've been to Israel, I told you there's fruit trees everywhere. Pomegranates, lemons, limes, uh, grapefruits, tangerines, mandarins, oranges, clementines. You, you have uh, banana trees everywhere. Okay, it's awesome. Then the nations which you left all around shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it and will do it. I will do it. I will also let the house of Israel inquire of me to do this for them. I will increase their, their men like a flock, like a flock offered as holy sacrifices, like a flock at Jerusalem. Okay, on the feast days, when people would come to, for the feast days, there was like three, four, five feast days that the men were commissioned to go to Israel. And it was an awesome thing. Even during the Passover, when Jesus was crucified, they estimate there's 1.5 million people in the area of Jerusalem. It's quite a bit. Or, yeah, I think it was at least that many people. And so it's just, it's gonna be something phenomenal is what the prophet is being told. Okay. So you're like, okay, that's great. Justin, what are you trying to say? It's not what I'm trying to say. It's what, the, what God, through the Holy Spirit, is trying to tell Ezekiel. Because chapter 37 has happened in Dan's lifetime. So think about it. The hand of the Lord came upon me, brought me out in the spirit of the Lord. He set me down in the midst of the valley and it was full of bones. And he caused me to pass them around. And behold, there were very many open. Indeed, they were very dry. Think about how skeletal the people looked coming out of the Auschwitzes and the death camps and the um, concentration camps. Again, he said, can these bones live? And, and the prophet's like, oh, you know, Lord, I'm not God. You're, you could do whatever you want, God. So he had faith, but he didn't have an answer to say. So he said, prophesy, say to them, hear the word of the Lord. And thus says the Lord, to these, the Lord God to these dry bones, surely I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will put ligaments or sinews and bring flesh upon you, cover you with flesh and breath in you and you shall live and know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and prophesied that there was a noise. And uh, you know, God breathed on Adam and he became a living being. And it's just a beautiful vision we have here of what looked like it was dead. And the nation of Israel looked dead for all intents and purposes, the final solution. Hitler, Mein Kampf, quite honestly, I don't know if you know this, but Margaret Sanger inspired Hitler. Margaret Sanger was a eugenist who was one of the biggest proponents of Planned Parenthood, was one of the biggest proponents of genocide of African-American children, by the way, and abortion and Planned Parenthood nationwide, and uh, Hitler read her book. And so it was about a final solution, murdering and, and depopulation and getting rid of all the Jews. It didn't happen. Some Yankee doodles came, and different men and God-fearing nations said, we will not have this, and we stood up against evil. If nothing uh, is done by righteous men, then evil will prevail. 
So indeed, he looked, all the flesh and everything, he sees this vision of these men coming together, breath coming into their lives, and they're living, and he commanded Ezekiel, and he said, um, basically, look at this army. Uh, he brought this army together. And when Israel became a nation, and we read this last week, when Israel became a nation in 1948, in May of 1948, that very day, they were attacked on every side. I don't know if you know this. Uh, May 14th, sorry, 1948, they declared they were a nation. And Jordan, Lebanon, Egypt, Syria, with tanks, soldiers, guns, planes, attacked from every direction. And Israel somehow held their ground because God miraculously saved them, protected them. So they had an army, and therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, of my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. So we talked about, is that from the Holocaust, maybe? And that you may know that I've opened your grave. So he said, I'll put my spirit in you. He's repeated that again. He said, there'll be one kingdom with one king. And no longer will there be this division of the ten tribes in the north, the two in the south. He'll take a stick, one that says Ephraim, one that says Israel, and he'll put them together. And so there's going to be a unity. There is a national unity that has existed since 1948. There might be labor parties, the Laiku party, the, the Orthodox party, the different parties politically. There's even a, a party that sympathized with the Muslims recently, a liberal party that was actually making things go really wonky and terrible lately. That even Amir Sarfati, uh, who's a, a born-again Christ, Christian Jew, or Jew, but he said this is just such a shame what had been happening before Netanyahu got reelected. There was about a year there where there were two different prime ministers, and it was a mess because they were trying to let Muslims dictate what they were to do, and, and it was anti-Israel. It was kind of like a woke agenda that's been shoved down our throats, but anyway... I say all that to say Satan is in the same agenda. He wants to redefine truth. He wants to destroy God's promises. He wants to confuse people. And it's pretty confusing when you say, we care about you and let's have open borders. We care about you. You can't do anything without having the jab. It's kind of weird that they were saying, hey, you've got to condone all of these things that are anti-Israel when that would cease them to exist. So God had a way of shaking and stirring it up. Guess what? Then they got attacked by their enemies on October 7th of this year. But they would be united in the last days. Thus says the Lord, surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations and make them one nation in the land. What land? The land that was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The land that was promised to Joseph and that David was told that out of your, out of your seed, one of your descendants will come one who will rule uh, over all people. So he was promised the Messiah. The only one people was promised the Messiah. Not Ishmaelites, not the descendants that practiced Islam and Muhammadism that was created 600 AD. It was David, 900 BC, 1000 BC, who was promised the Messiah. So the Jews, whether you like it or not, Jesus is a Jew. And he's a good Jewish boy. He never disobeyed, never sinned. Isn't that awesome? So that he could take our place. So one king, some people say this is kind of pointing to, um, uh, if you read Revelation 20 and some different passages in Isaiah that King David and King Jesus might co-regent or co-rule for Mount Zion in the kingdom age during the thousand years. What's that mean? It means we're all going to be in new bodies when we rule and reign for a thousand years after the rapture, after the tribulation. And I think King David and Jesus might rule. So that kind of solves some confusion if you read about David ruling because Jesus will rule and we will rule with him. But he goes on to say here, um, they shall not defile themselves, no more detestable things. Um, David, my servant, shall be king over them. I think that's talking about the thousand years. That's, I'm sorry, I foreshadowed that a little bit. But I do believe during the kingdom age, we will rule with Jesus. I don't know if that Hawaii will exist anymore because all the islands will flee away, but we'll all have different governances. We won't be able to sin. We won't die. We won't need to sleep. I don't know what I'm going to do all night, but I might do some night golf. I might, I might do some fun activities. I talk with my boys about it all the time. Like, what are we going to do? We're not tired and we eat because we want to, not because we have to. And we're not cranky. We don't get sick. And I don't have to brush my teeth anymore. I like going to my hyg hygienist. She's my wife. But anyway. But they shall dwell in the land that I've given to Jacob, my servant. And uh, so all these promises. Where, where were the Jews ever promised Israel? All over the place. All over the place. And this is... 600 BC, uh, 606 BC is when, sorry, 540, 530 BC. This is 2400, 2500 years ago, 2500 years ago. <clears throat> 
So Hamas, Hezbollah, you need to listen up. Anyway, I don't approve everything that every Jew ever does, but there was a promised land. I will establish them. I will multiply them. Who will? God. The United States? No, God. What happens if the United States isn't around? Well, I don't read of us in this next upcoming chapter. Barely. Uh, my tabernacle also shall be with them. He's going to dwell with them. The nations will know. What? That I, the Lord, set apart Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. Hmm. There's, what does he mean by that? It could be loosely saying that there's going to be another temple built. And there's plenty of room on the Temple Mount near the mosque, the al Aska Mosque, the Dome of the Rock Mosque. Actually, that used to be a Byzantine church, by the way. It has tons of stars of David all over it. <laughs> they never got rid of those. But uh, I say all that to say, here we are. Um, chapter 38, right? Now, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel. I know I told you it'd be a 10 or 20 minute update. I just can't. Just can't. Son of man, set your face against Gog. What's Gog? Gog is like a ruler of the land of Magog. The prince of Rosh. What is Rosh? Let's hover over this. I, you get some real practical help here. The Targum Vulgate. And Aquila, read of the chief prince. Also verse 3. What are we saying here? Um, I need to zoom out a little bit. The chief prince. Prince of Rosh. Well, let's hit tools here. Bear with me. And we're going to look at the word for Rosh. Land of Magog. Um, and this is where you go to the, the actual um, meaning of the words. Where are you, Rosh? Rosh, Rosh. Okay, so. It says, Son of man, set thy face against the land of Magog, the prince Meshach Tubal, and prophesy against him. It's in the last verse. I'll say. Gog, the land of Magog. Okay, let's just see what Magog means. So Magog was the second son of Japheth. You guys remember Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth? The Japhethites settled north. Um, progenitor of several tribes northward from Israel. Well, what is the country that's most north of Israel? Can you guys help me out there? What? No, like furthest north. Russia. Interesting that even in the English Vulgate, Rosh sounds like Russia, right? Isn't that interesting? The mountainous region between Cappadocia and Media. The Medo, Media is like Medo-Persians is the Iranian Empire, so that's down near the Persian Gulf to the southeast. But uh, Cappadocia, when you read Peter's letters, he says to all of the aliens of the dispersion and Bithynia, Cappadocia, Asia. Um, so Cappadocia is kind of more north central, north of Turkey. Um, but scholars say that Rosh and even these cities like Meshach and Tubal um, could be modern day Moscow and Tobolsk or these two different cities in Russia. So I'm looking at Meshach right now. The drawing out, um, son of Japheth. Now, it's uh, not really easy to see here, but can you see how easy it is to find cross-references when you're looking something up? Not, it's not super complicated. But uh, I would encourage you, if you've never heard of Joel Rosenberg, he is a Messianic Jew who, he's American, but now he's living in Israel. He wrote a book called The Ezekiel Option. He wrote a book called um, Epicenter. And he was one of the first ones who I read this whole passage from his perspective, but he basically said these modern cities are two of the most populated cities in Russia today. So it's just all the scholars kind of agree that these are prominent cities of the land most north of Israel. And this is a leader, could be like the czar or the king of Rosh, of Russia. Okay, so I'm not going to belabor that too much. I know we just hit on quite a few things there. But he says, I will turn you around. Who will? Who's doing this? Is this um, the UN doing it? Is it Hamas? No. It's God saying, I'm going to turn you around. God's in the details. God naturally works supernaturally. 
He's going to put a hook in their jaw. It's a graphic image. They used to do that. The Assyrians used to do that to the Israelites. That's why Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh, by the way. They would literally put hooks in people's jaws and drag them away, like break out their teeth. Don't even. But he said, I'll lead you out with your army, horses, horsemen, splendidly clothed, great company with bucklers and shields and them handling swords, okay? Uh, I don't want to get bogged down in, oh, it's horses, it's not tanks. Well, this is Ezekiel re rehearsing and repeating to us what he had. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, with them. Persia's modern-day Iran, okay? Medo-Persian Empire. Libya, or Kush right there in Hebrew, but Libya. Um, is Libya full of Muslims right now, by the way? Uh, and then with shield and helmet, and then Gomer, I believe Gomer and all his troops in the house of Togarma uh, from the far north and his troops, many are with you. Prepare yourself, be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about you, and be guard, be a guard for them. Okay, I'm showing you guys, showing you guys how to find this, okay? When we look at Togarma, I'm not making this up. Gomer, let's look at Gomer, right? When you click on Gomer where it is, um, it's not helping, but it's, uh, it does have a little bit more of the background. But I believe that to Togarma and Gomer, I don't want to tell you wrong, but one of those is modern day Turkey, okay? <clears throat> We know that Kush or Persia is referring to Iran. We know Libya and some translations say Ethiopia here as referring to the northern part of Africa, modern day Africa. Okay? So pardon me. We're going to move on. Prepare yourself. Be ready for you and all your companies that gathered about you. Be a guard for them. After many days, you will be visited in the latter years. Now, that's kind of the key thing. You're like, Justin, what are you talking about? If it was just me kind of making this up, it's, it, uh, you can trust. This is not my opinion. In the latter years, are we getting close to the latter days? Would you say we're kind of close to the end? With Jesus said, a lot of earthquakes, pestilence, wars and rumors of wars. And the end will not be yet. But the latter years, you'll come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate, 1900 years, since AD 70. 1880 years. And they were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. For many, for 75 years, Israel has dwelt in the land. You will ascend, coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud. You and all your troops, many peoples with you. Who? Gog, the Tsar of Russia, the leader of Russia. Could it be Vladimir Putin? Very well could be. What's he going to do? Come after me. I don't, he's the richest man in the world. Could be him. Thus says the Lord God. On that day you shall come, it shall come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind and you will make an evil plan. You will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages to a peaceful people dwell, who dwell safely. All of them dwelling without walls have neither bars nor gates. And to take plunder or spoil or booty and to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited and against the people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the midst of the land. Now, this is where it gets really interesting for the last two to five years, what's transpired. I think we may have missed where the, the waste places become like a, we, said, we read about the Garden of Eden, but you guys need to know that Israel is the leading exporter of flowers and fruits to, to Europe. They've been blessed with their agriculture and here says that they have a lot of livestock and goods they also have right off the coast near cyprus near the coast of haifa there is a number of them but one that's called leviathan which is a natural gas deposit that has trillions of dollars worth of natural gas or billions at least uh, so they have a lot of natural resources but notice sheba dedan and the merchants of tarshish is america in the scriptures well, this might be an illusion. We talked about it last week. Tarshish is the furthest west countries of Europe. When 
Jonah ran away from the Lord. He went to a ship for Tarshish, which could have been Portugal, Spain, England. And guess who are the young lions of Tarshish? Western Europe, America, Australia, Canada, right? But notice what happened when Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine in March of 2021, or 2022, sorry. What happened is nothing. But we are so embroiled with corruption due to the Biden family, quite frankly, and other politicians. I'm not going to say it was just them. And now we've spent over $200 billion. And what do we have to show for it? But notice, he invaded Lugansk and Donetsk, the two states in the furthest east portion of Ukraine, which is the breadbasket of Europe, which produces more wheat and crops than any other nation. But they, they invaded, notice, the two sections they partitioned off so that they could have greater access to the sea, also so that they could, they had already annexed Crimea, Crimea, because they needed to have like a freshwater port. But these portions of Ukraine already spoke Russian. So you may not have known that. I knew this on the ground March of 2022. But knowing this, no one stopped Putin. We act like we are because we're just throwing money and weapons at the problem. And there's skirmishes and there's battles, but They've annexed those two major states of Donetsk and Lugansk. Sheba and Didan, does anybody know what nation that is from last week? Extra credit. It's easy. So Saudi Arabia. So just remember, Sheba, Didan, SD, Saudi, right? Saudi Arabians. Notice that when Trump was in office, there were the Abrahamic Accords. His son-in-law is a Jewish person, but they were... The United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt have all become friendly to Israel because they're like, oh, you're not as wild as a donkey with your hand against your brothers. Let's do some deals because you're rich, you're smart, you're democratic, you are capitalistic. We can make money selling you oil or, or bartering with you or having arms deals or having peace with you. Well, do you know that they were on the verge of making another agreement when October 7th popped off in Hamas? went ahead and prematurely, but they decided to attack without Le- Lebanon Hamas, or the Lebanese in the north, uh, Hezbollah's authority or Iranian guard. They just like, hey, it's Rosh Hashanah, everybody's, or it's Yom Kippur, what, what was it? It was Rosh Hashanah, I don't know. It was like their new year on Saturday. It was Shabbat, it was a Sabbath, and everybody was home. And they, they attacked when everybody was off guard. So Saudi Arabia? Western Europe and Americas, what do they say? What do they do? Does it say that they come with fury and fire and sword and shield and buckler? No, it says, hey, hey guys, can we all get along? Are you coming here to take spoils? What are you guys doing? What do you think you're doing? That's all they say. Have you gathered an army to take spoil? Carry away some silver and gold and take livestock and goods to take great plunder? Hey, are you, are you up to something? Look what happened in Ukraine. No one stopped Putin. What if we're right on the verge of seeing this battle take place? That's, that's my premise to you all. It's been, they've been talking about this for decades. What you also need to know is that within Syria, it says, I believe in Isaiah 19, it's the, about Egypt, Egyptian to be against Egyptian. It also talks about the Aswan Dam and how the fishermen would be put out of industry because when they built the Aswan Dam in the 60s, it ruined the Nile River and there was no more flooding and the snails ate all of the marshlands and now they thought they were going to reclaim more farmland, but instead you have all the fishermen out of market because the snails ate all the the cat lilies or the lily tip, you know, whatever the marshes where the fish would hide. So now all the Egyptians moved to the cities and then you had the, the, the Arab Spring and when Hillary Rodham Clinton was our Secretary of State, she had endorsed the Muslim Brotherhood, which is now a terroristic organization, and put Morabak in power. I think this was around 2010. And there was a civil war in Egypt. And now, since that time, Egypt has become a third world country, basically. But notice, all the diplomats do is talk. And this does not stop Gog of the land of Magog or Rosh, this leader, this ruler from the furthest north land of Israel, from coming down to take spoil. 
Therefore, Son of Man, prophesy and say to God, Thus says the Lord God, On that day, when my people Israel dwells safely, will you not know it? Then you will come from your place out of the north, many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, probably not Teslas, but this whole electric, it's, it's just not sustainable, it's crazy. It's suicide. And it's so inhumane to the African children that are mining cobalt and lithium, let me just tell you. Like, I have a hybrid vehicle. I've had it for 12 years. I will never go full electric. Why? They're probably going to be, they might be riding horses or like gasoline, oil. There's tons of oil in Israel right now. There's tons of oil right off the coast. It is deliberate what we're seeing with the global agenda to destroy America, middle class, and to set the stage for this battle. Sorry, not sorry. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days. This is how I know this is yet future. This is the latter days. That I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me. God is putting a hook in his jaw to force him against Israel so the nations know how powerful God is. Okay? Does that make sense to you all? When Germany got shamed, when every nation that's tried to exterminate the Jews, what's happened to them? Look at Egypt, look at Assyria, look at Babylon, look at the Greeks, look at the Romans, look at Germany, right? So what about all these Muslims that, I mean, have you not seen all the parades of people that are saying, kill all the Jews and this was righteous and they should have, you know, this is, they deserve, they're occupiers. Have you guys seen this over the last three or four weeks? It's insane. I'm not going to be quiet about it. It's demonic. It is demonic. Now, will they show you the worst of the worst of these Jews saying explicatives and sometimes they get in their feelings? Sure. But you don't attack God's chosen people and act like they're not human. Everybody's human. I care for the people of Gaza. I really am heartbroken about the innocents that are being killed. I'm really heart, heartbroken about the death and destruction. But thus says the Lord, are you he of whom I have spoken in the former days? By my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them. For many decades, there have been advisors who've gone to speak to Reagan and different presidents telling, them about, telling him about this future invasion. It's not happened yet. Never in history. And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of, of Israel. This is like the leader of Russia. That the Lord God says, my fury... My fury will show in my face. Have you ever gotten so mad and you almost like frighten people because you're like, you will, like mama bear comes out or papa bear comes out, right? And there's a time. There's a time. And this is what God's kind of saying. He's saying, my jealousy and in fire, the fire of my wrath, I have spoken surely in the day. In that day, there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. Now, I told you guys geographically, if you look at a map of Israel, there's a coastal plain, there's a fertile valley, there's some mountains in the north, a desert in the south, and then there's a rift valley because there's a huge fault line that the Jordan River runs along. And you're driving down to the Dead Sea and, and you're along the Jordanian border, which is literally Israel. There's a big rift. It's almost like a canyon, okay? Okay. A lot of fault lines. Just saying. And it says here, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, and all the creeping things that creep on the earth, and the men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down. The steep places shall fall. Every wall shall fall to the ground. There's going to be some sort of seismic activity, some event, some earthquake that unquestionably will be catastrophic. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains. Says the Lord God, every man's sword will be against his brother. Have you ever seen how the Sunnis and Shiites can't even get along with each other? Anybody? You know what I'm talking about? The Sunnis are the Muslims that are more moderate. They're like, we kind of like the Western society amenities. The Shiites are like, if I commit suicide and kill people with me, I'm a martyr and I get to have seven virgins and I live in the afterlife with great glorious splendor. I mean, they're like, and, and they'll, when ISIS took over Syria, 
This is what I was going to tell you earlier. Um, the, lar- the oldest standing city in the world is Damascus, and Isaiah says it will be a heap of ruins in the last days. But when ISIS took over in Syria, when we pulled out of Iraq and there was a huge vacuum during Obama, which we're around like Obama 2.0 right now with Biden, by the way, when that happened, ISIS was the Shiite brand and he kept saying ISIL. You know why Obama said ISIL? Because he was calling the Levant, which includes Israel, he was saying that all belongs to the Muslims. So Mr. Christian, he's not Christian, he's Muslim, because he's saying... Give them ISIL. We call them ISIL. No, they're ISIS. They're terrorists. And by the way, they would drive beside SUVs like GMC Denali's or whatever, and they would machine gun Sunnis from their F-150s or Toyota Tacomas with machine guns on the back or whatever. The Shiites hate the Sunnis. Who are the Sunnis? Well, Sheba and Dedan, Saudi Arabia. And they used to murder people on the streets and punish them and cut off their hands and all this stuff. And women didn't have any rights. But now women can drive in Saudi Arabia. If you look at United Arab Emirates, they, the largest hotel in the world is in, help me, help me, five star, the only six star hotel in the world. And they built these islands in the sands and the waters. <coughs> Dubai, you guys heard of Dubai? Okay. Many, many slaves have helped build Dubai from India and people who make two or three dollars a day, it's horrible. But they are an oasis and it's all oil money. And it's Sunni Muslims and the sheiks and the, the rich, rich Saudis who are doing it. And the LIV, Greg Norman's golf tour, LIV, that was so controversial because the PGA Tour players were getting paid $100 million just to play on this tour. I'm not even joking, it's a lot of money. They were sellouts. Well, that's the Saudis who are funding that. I'm not pulling any punches. I hope you guys are like, this is all verifiable. I'm not making this up. It's not conspiracy. It's reality. But he says, a sword, every man will swords will be against one another. Man, I've seen a lot of videos lately of how it's just like barbaric. Some of the things that some of these extremists are doing. And it's not Christian extremists, it's not Jewish extremists, it's the Jewish extremists are the Orthodox that are saying, stop the genocide. There's actually Jews that are against Zionism and against the military actions of Israel right now. The Orthodox Jews, a lot of them are like, stop this, this is not good. It's, but it's just more like the moderate Israelites, they're kind of like blue collar Israelites, are like, they attacked us, we're gonna exterminate them. We're done with this terrorism. We've lived with 75 years of stabbings, bombings, car accidents, Murders, rockets. When I was in Israel for one week in November, what, November 6th through the 15th of 2018, there were 500 rockets shot at Israel from Gaza. I was down in En Gedi, down by the Dead Sea, where Saul was chasing after David, and there's this fountain there. I'm looking over there, and we hear this. Whoa, 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 whoa. We go down to this uh, restaurant where the Dead Sea is, and there's Masada. We went up to Masada, the Herod's fortress. And they said, yeah, a five-story Hamas headquarters was just blown up. We could hear it. So as safe as you'll feel in Israel, they've been under onslaught from rockets, off and on for seven, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. Who's funding that? Iran. Who's allowing Iran to have billions of more dollars? Obama and Biden. Okay, there we go. So every man's sword against his brother. I do believe that it's highly likely that you're going to have some of the Turkish forces, the Iranian guard, the Russian guard, and some of these Libyans and some of these rogue people who are already kind of assembled in Syria because over the last 10 years there's been a civil war, 400 to 500,000 Syrians have died. Assad was helped by Putin to be protected from his own people. The Kurds in the north massacred. The Yazidis, I haven't even said their name in years. The Yazidis are a sect of Christianity and this woman, she went before the parliament or whatever in Syria and she says, She's weeping and saying, why won't you help my people? They're exterminating us. And they were, and they did. But this Assad guy is like a, a, he's a puppet vassal for Putin. He's just been rescued by Putin and he's Putin and the Iranian guard. They do arms deals with one another, the Persians. All of these forces have never been more aligned than they are today. And they're just kind of hanging out in Syria with, within a couple hundred miles of Israel. When you go up in the Golan Heights in the northern part of Israel, you can see Lebanon, you can see Syria, and literally see the countries. And so they're always on guard about it. 
And there were some Hezbollah attacks from southern Lebanon recently. Every man's sword will be against, so there's going to be some infighting. There will be judgment, pestilence, bloodshed, and note this. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstorm, hailstone, sorry, fire and brimstone. I know I'm not even helping you guys because we're repeating last week, but in the five cities of Sodom and Gomorrah that have been discovered by the Dead Sea, you can find golf ball sized sulfur balls that are 99.9% pure sulfur that you can't even manufacture anywhere else. They're They're not found anywhere else in the world except the five cities of Sodom and Gomorrah that were destroyed. And you set them on fire and it's a blue iridescent flame and it's so noxious or so poisonous. The gases, you can't, you light it indoors, you have to evacuate the building. It's horrible, but they're everywhere, okay? There are ziggurats, there are 90 degree angles, there are buildings, there's temples, there's streets, there's all sorts of things that lie as ash heaps. You know like a phone book, the thin paper on a phone book, a big phone book? It's like you grab the walls and it's like a ash phone book. You can just kind of like rip it off. And so I say all this to say, YouTube, YouTube it, but the fire stones, the hail stones, the sulfur stones, there could be an earthquake, sulfur spontaneously comes from the sky, maybe it comes from the ground, goes back up. God did it before, he can do it again. He's done it in that region with Sodom and Gomorrah, he can do it again with the forces of Iran, Turkey, and Russia. Are you all following me so far? Iran, Russia, Turkey are gonna invade, God's gonna bring an earthquake, they're gonna turn their swords against each other in the confusion, shoot their missiles or shoot their guns or stab each other, whatever they do. And oh yeah, by the way, there's going to be fire and brimstone. They'll die from the noxious gases within minutes before they die, if they're ever hit. If they're in armored vehicles, they're not going to have any oxygen, right? Why do I say this with confidence? I've read this passage many, many times. I was skeptic at first, but keep going. Then I will magnify myself, sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. They shall know that I am the Lord. And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around, leave you, bringing you up from the north, from the far north, notice, far north of Israel is Russia, and bring you against the the mountains of Israel. Then I will knock the bow out of your left hand. Notice he's going to make his, maybe his weapons fail. Interesting. You shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and your troops and peoples who are with you. I will give you to the birds of prey of every sort of beast and a beast of the field. You shall fall on the open field for I have spoken, says the Lord. I will send fire on Magog. So some people think there will be fires in Russia. There'll be like some infrastructure problems. Uh, I don't know that America or Saudi Arabia are gonna be a part of this. I just think it's gonna be a work of God. It goes on to say, they shall know what the coastlands It may be Moscow, it may be St. Petersburg, it may be all over Russia. They shall know what? That I am the Lord. They will know that God defended Israel. Not America, not the Eisenhower, right? Not our naval fleet. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people of Israel. I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. The nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming, it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day which I have spoken Then those who dwell in the cities of Israel will go out and set on fire and burn weapons, both the shields and bucklers, the bows and arrows, the javelins and spears. They shall make fires with them for seven years. They're going to be able to burn the shields, spears, and weapons of of the Russian army for seven years. Do with that what you want, but that sounds like seven years of free fuel. And it's almost like God's blessing them with more supplies. Now, there have been times where they found night vision and weapons, arms, everything stored just north of Israel, just beyond the border that have been stored like in imminent attack or in a planned invasion. Israel's found and stumbled upon this in recent years. But in this case, we know there will be many people will be cut down. Uh, They won't have to cut any wood for a while because they'll have all this burnable, whatever, steel, I don't know what they'll burn, but they'll make fires with the weapons and they will plunder those who plundered them and pillage those who pillaged them, says the Lord. Sorry to repeat all this. It's hard. Okay. So then they bury these bodies 
And I mean, I've gone through this four or five times before, but notice, whenever someone's traveling and they see a bone, they mark it um, and they bury them to cleanse the land. And it says uh, they'll, they'll bury those bones in the Valley of Haman, God, Gog. There will be people that are employed and that's their only job is they're not like the undertaker, but they're like uh, quarantined body barriers. And it says whenever someone passes through, finds a bone that they mark it with a standard and they're going to be doing this for seven months. There's going to be so many dead bodies and bones and things that are, I don't know if it's biochemical warfare that's going to happen to, in part, but they're going to be things that cannot be touched without being buried in this place. So you're seeing uh, mass graves right now with all the disaster happening in Gaza right now. It's really horrible. But in order to cleanse a month for se or the lands for seven months, God will have them make a search. And they'll find the bones. It says, notice, set up a marker, buy it, and the barriers will bury it in the valley of Ham and Gog. And the name of the city will be Hamona. They shall cleanse the land. And then he says, um, every beast and bird will be able to gorge themselves. They're going to be able to eat a lot. Okay, so that's pretty graphic. Justin, why are you reading all this? Because he's going to glorify his name among the nations, and the nations shall see his judgment. When God delivers Israel in this future battle, everybody will know. It wasn't America. It wasn't Europe. It wasn't NATO. It wasn't United Nations. It wasn't Saudi Arabia. It was God. We don't have, the, we have, what do you call them? Guided energy weapons. Lasers. Don't get me started. But we can't cause an earthquake like God's going to cause an earthquake. We can't cause the confusion like he did with Gideon when Gideon surrounded the Midianites. And remember, they broke the pots and they had the clay jars and they had the horns that they blew, the trumpets, I should say, and they had the, the torches. And some 300 men put to flight 20, 30, 40,000 Midianites. They, they defeated the enemy armies. How? Because God caused the soldiers to turn their swords on themselves. There have been stories like that, the Six-Day War, the 1973 War, 1948 when they were invaded. But the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. The Gentiles, that's us, but we're hopefully already in heaven by this. We, we could be here when this happens. They shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity because they were unfaithful to me. Therefore, my face was hidden from them. I have given them into the hands of their enemies, the Babylonians, the Assyrians. <coughs> And they fell by the sword. According to their uncleanness, unclean, according to their transgressions, I have dealt with them and hid my face from them. Therefore, says the Lord God, now I will bring back the captives of Jacob, have mercy on the whole house of Israel, and I will be jealous for my holy name after they, uh, after they have borne their shame and all the unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me when they dwelt safely in their own land and no one made them afraid. When I brought them back from the peoples and gathered them out for the, from their enemies' lands, I am hallowed in them in the sight of of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord their God who sent them into captivity among the nations, but also brought them back to their land and let none of them captive, left none of them captive any longer. And I will not hide my face from them anymore for I have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord God. So he's gonna do a great work. I believe that that's gonna be a precipice or a leading in, an antecedent or a lead into the tribulation. Now, what's interesting is Oh yeah, chapter 40, what does he start talking about? A new temple. Not saying that this is the tribulation temple, but there's a new temple that's kind of talked about. And I'm not sure that Ezekiel's, like I said, his temple that he goes for the next few chapters describing is this last day's temple. But interesting, if the Muslims, oh, how did we miss that verse? There was a verse that said in the last chapter, um, that five-sixths of the armies will be destroyed. You're saying, where, where do you see that? So five out of the six of the... Uh, of these invaders will be cut down, okay? Let me see here. And if these are mostly Muslim nations, if you think about it... Um, there's not going to be much that stands in the way of a building of a temple on the Temple Mount, right? A lot of these people that are protesting in the streets since October 7th are Muslim sympathizers with the Hamas. They are not 
acknowledging anything about the atrocities. They're saying, well, that's nothing compared to what Israel's done for years. No, it's really horrible what they did. When they killed 1,200 people, when they burned people alive, when they ransacked their houses, when they put a baby in an oven, when they, killed, they raped all these women, they did all these things maliciously, it was demonic. Okay. But five-sixths of the armies that come against Israel will be destroyed. Um, and you say, how many people could this be? This could be millions upon millions of people. Are, are we excited about this? Absolutely not. Does it grieve us? Yes. Um, but God is God. I am not. Okay. So, go ahead. When does China enter into the picture? Okay, that's a good question. So this is a battle that's yet, happen, yet to happen in the future that I believe could precede the tribulation. It could happen any time. The rapture could happen at any time. So this and the rapture are two things I believe in scripture that could happen at any time. The kings of the east cross over the Euphrates River. Revelation 20 says at the end, or 19 says at the end of the tribulation period when the beast is wreaking havoc on earth. And we just read about this in Daniel chapter 11 last Sunday morning. And had I not read it last week, it would be a little more jumbled to me. But this beastly character who's ruling the world will be on a rampage and he'll be kind of trying to conquer Egyptian area. And there'll be the kings of the east that are invading. He'll turn back and the valley of him Armageddon or Megiddo, the Valley of Jehoshaphat. This great valley is going to be where all the armies of the kings of the rising sun and the Antichrist forces will meet. It's the largest valley. I think Napoleon Bonaparte said it's the greatest battlefield in the world. And they'll converge and Jesus will come down and he'll slay them out with the sword out of his mouth, with the word of his mouth. He'll set his foot on the Mount of Olives, Zechariah 12, 13, 14. He will, he will put his foot on the Mount of Olives. It will split. Um, I believe when uh, in Ezekiel, in the latter part of Zechariah, it says that there will be a river from the, the Mediterranean Sea will come up to Zion, and a river will flow from Mount Zion to the Dead Sea and heal the water so that people will be able to fish. And it's the most salty, lowest sea on the earth right now. It's hard to imagine that you could fish. There are sinkholes, but that's not going to be a sinkhole. The whole sea of Dead Sea will be healed. So Jesus will come at the end of the tribulation, seven-year period, Jacob's trouble. He will set up an eternal kingdom. And guess who's going to come back with Jesus? It's not a trick question. Who's going to come back with Jesus? Us, yeah. In glorified bodies. No more sin, no more complaining, no more... Toothaches, no more. I need to do more sit-ups and push-ups. My kids make fun of me. I've never weighed more in my life. You know, you don't have to worry about weight, what you weigh. You can eat, you won't get it. Yeah, right? So you can enjoy a glorified body, rule and reign with Christ, and for a thousand years, we're going to be in this eternal state, and, or this perfect state. At the end of the thousand years, Revelation 20 says, Satan will be loosed for a short period of time, and their books will be opened, and Satan will be cast into the lake of fire. And every person who, after 1,000 years of perfect government with King Jesus, maybe King David too, every person that did not willingly bow their knee and swear allegiance or, or put their faith and trust and hope in Jesus will be cast into the lake of fire. It's really horrible. And then he will create a new heavens, a new heavenly Jerusalem, and a new earth. So there's 12 gates for the apostles, 12 gates for the, for the 12 tribes of Israel, and there's a new earth. So everything that's good about earth, that you love about earth, you know, you like food, you like sports, you like animals, you like your family most of the time, you know, and you, all these things that you get to enjoy without sin. But yeah, the kings of the East, it says a 200, mil, like 2,000 times 2,000, like 200 million man army. The only nation in the world that can, other than India, that could, which that could be part of it, like maybe it's a conglomeration of India and China, 
But the kings of the east, or the kings of the land of the rising sun, is kind of the illusion. Come over a dry Euphrates river, and that's where the, they meet the Antichrist forces. There will be nations that will not yield to the Antichrist. But it's very clear that if you do not take the mark of the name or the number of the beast, then you'll be beheaded. So, good question. So I do think that the two things that we don't know when they will happen, Jesus said, you don't know the day of my return. 1 Thessalonians 4, 2 Thessalonians 2. 1 Thessalonians 4 says, we who are alive and remain till the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have, who have passed or have gone before, like who have passed, that those who are dead in Christ will rise first and we who are alive and remain will be gathered together with him in the air where we will ever be with the Lord. So once you're raptured with the Lord forever, and then we go to him, and he's our, he's our king, but he's also our lord, our master. So we say, what's our assignment? He gives you your job, and uh, you'll, have, you'll have work to do, and you'll enjoy it. So we'll rule and reign with him. So I'm going to hit a few of the highlights on this book before we pray tonight. But we went over, uh, did God choose Jacob, the nation of Israel, or just the man Jacob? Did God choose the nation of Israel, or just the man Jacob? The answer is Jacob is Israel. If you look at Genesis 32, Jacob was one of the sons of uh, Isaac. And remember, he kind of tricked his brother out of the blessing and the birthright. He sold his, his uh, birthright for a cup of stew. Esau, Red, they call him Red. His name's Harry, also. His name's Harry. But they called him Red because he ate some red stew and he had red hair. But... Uh, He's like, I'm going to die if you don't feed me. He came in from hunting, and Jacob's like, okay, give me, your, give me your birthright. He's like, I don't care if I'm dead. So he despised his birthright. Jacob tricked him out of it. And then God, uh, and Jacob and his mother, Rebecca, kind of tricked and put goat skins on him, and he pretended to be Isaac, or Isaac's son, Ishmael. Sorry. Isaac's son, Esau, Harry. He pretended to be Harry, but he was actually a, kind of a mama's boy, and he was not Harry. But he had goat skin, and he lied to his father two or three times. But Isaac blessed Jacob. Jacob later wrestled with the Lord in Genesis 32. He had a vision of angels ascending and descending on a ladder. He wrestled with God, and some people think that was a Christophany. He wrestled with Jesus, and, Jesus, and the angel of the Lord, or God himself, touched his hip, so he was always walking with a limp touched his ligament in his hip, dislocated his hip. And he said, you know, who are you? He said, you know, why do you ask who am I? He's like, what's your name? And he, he said, my name is Jacob. And he said, because he lied to his father two or three times, I'm, I'm Esau, I'm Esau, I'm Esau. When he said, I'm Jacob, the name Jacob, Yaakov, means heel catcher. Because when Esau was coming out of the womb, Jacob was grabbing onto Esau's heel which means supplanter, so kind of a tricky, devious one. He said, I'm Yaakov. And he said, okay, no longer are you going to be called Jacob or Yaakov. You're going to be called Israel or, or one who's governed by God. So Jacob was called Israel from that point on. And he had some moments where he, he lacked in his faith. He showed favoritism to his son Joseph. We talked about that last week. But when Jacob wrestled with the Lord in Genesis 32, the Lord changed his name to Israel. And all throughout Scripture, the tribes of Israel called the sons, were called the sons of Jacob, Yes, God chose Jacob, and that is the same as choosing Israel. The promises made to Israel were not for only one person, but for the whole nation. In the Bible, sometimes the nation of Israel is referred to as Jacob and vice versa. You cannot separate them. The Lord said through the prophet Malachi, I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. It's Malachi 3.6. Even though since their early days, the Israelites have drifted away from the Lord's ordinances, God himself confirmed that Jacob is the nation, or is nation Israel. National Israel. So Jacob, Israel, interchangeable. Um, they also were referred to as Ephraim in the north during Hosea. If you read Hosea, he talks about Ephraim and Israel, two different. It's when the nation was divided after Solomon with Rehoboam. Okay, so when God had made his covenant with the promise and promises with national Israel, he also made promises regarding the land of Israel. In Genesis 17, 8, the Lord, this is Barry Stagner, by the way, he says, the Lord, he said he was giving the land of Canaan to the descendants of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob in Genesis 17, 8, and not through Ishmael. We talked about this. Ishmael and Hagar had already been put out. 
and God was promising through Isaac. The Muslims agree that Abraham is the father of their nation too, but then they disagree when it comes to Ishmael versus Isaac. They choose Hagar's son Ishmael as their forefather, so to speak. And the Jews are like, no, we come from Isaac. Jesus came from Isaac. We could read Matthew chapter 1. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob um, had Judah, and Perez by Tamar, his daughter-in-law. Perez had um, Amnon. It just goes on. It goes Melchizedek. It goes all the way down to Joseph, the son of Jesse, the father of Matthew, or the father of, of Jesus in Matthew. Okay? So on and so forth. There's a genealogy that goes all the way back to Isaac. There's no Ishmael list. In fact, Esau really displeased Jacob when he married an Ishmaelite. He married two or three wives. And he's just, and he, he realized, oh, I shouldn't have done that. The Ishmaelites have not been blessed in the same way as Israel. He said to Abraham, he will be a great nation because Abraham's like, oh, bless Ishmael. He's like, no, he'll be a great nation, but he'll be wild as a donkey and his hand will be against his brothers. He will be a great nation. So he says here, not through Ishmael as an everlasting possession, but through Isaac and Jacob. And so not only did God choose the nation of Israel, he also chose the land that would become their national home. Why would God give all the land of Canaan to one man? That makes sense. He didn't. He gave the land as an everlasting possession to the Jewish people. In case you've wondered, the people of Israel began to be referred to as Jews after the Babylonian captivity because the majority of the captives were from Judah, Benjamin and Judah in the south. During uh, Jeremiah's prophecies, there were three different Babylonian captivities. I think it was 606 BC, 597 BC was the last one. I think 603, 606, 597. But Nebuchadnezzar took the, by, the best and brightest, the brain drain, and he took the rich and the nobles from Judah. So they called them Jews. Today, not all Israelis are Jews in the sense of geographic homeland, but in a spiritual sense. The Jews, Israel, and Jacob are all references to the same people group, not a single individual. So there's a few other questions. I'm not going to read all the answers to them, but I want you to think about them. Is the rebirth of Israel important in Bible prophecy? We hit on it yesterday. I read on it today in Ezekiel 37, 38, 36, and 37. Israel being a, a nation in the last days is huge because the Hebrew language now exists. We talked about that last week. Jesus was a Jew. He fulfilled all the law and the prophets, okay? And he still has prophecies yet to fulfill. And... Because they were brought back from captivity and God made good on that promise, we know that when Jesus says in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you, and if it weren't so, I'd tell you plainly, but where I am, you can be also. When he says, I'm going to bring you to heaven with me, we can take that to the bank. So Satan wants us to think that Israel is no longer important in God's plan because he wants us to doubt all the other promises. We shouldn't. What did Paul mean when he said all Israel will be saved in Romans 11:26? Has God cast away his people, says there in verse 1? Certainly not. Um, Paul taught that the grafting of the Gentiles, that they're the root that supports us. As Gentiles, we get to join in the promises that were given to the Jews through faith in Jesus Christ. If it weren't for the Jews, we wouldn't even know the scriptures. We wouldn't even know the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Adam, and Eve, even Noah, and all that. David, we wouldn't know. So we don't brag against them and act like we're better than them. It's because of them that we have the promises. Does that make sense? So in short, the fullness of the Gentiles has to come in. When the end of that happens, I, that's like verses uh, 25 and 26 of Romans 11. Then according to Zechariah 14, 8, uh, the sad part about the tribulation is that two-thirds of the, the Jews will die during the tribulation. But there's a seven-year period of tribulation. Um, there is, when he says all Israel be saved, there, Israel has to be in the land in the last days for um, Romans 11, what Paul penned to come true. But it says here, again, the under, this underscores the necessity of there being in Israel for all Israel to be saved. Quote, all Israel to be saved. The covenant people who were promised a holy one who would save them, as stated in Zechariah 9.16, have yet to see this fulfilled. But with the Jews back in their national homeland and in the position, possession of their capital city, Jerusalem, it is possible. Uh, there is a prophecy in Zechariah that says they will look upon him whom they've pierced. There will come a time where a lot of the Jews will realize, oh, the beast, 
the, the false prophet, the, the beast is not our Messiah and they'll recognize Jesus as the Messiah and they'll be like, oh no, we crucify. They'll mourn for him like they did for their firstborn son. Um, there will be a great revelation to the Jews. There will be a great revival. And satanically, a lot of the Jews will be murdered by the beast or by the Antichrist. Are the annexation efforts in Israel today found in Bible prophecy? We just read Ezekiel 36 and 37. The fact that Israel is in the land, again, is why we believe that the events of Ezekiel 38 and 39 are right around the corner. God gave the land to the Jews and said he would bring them back, and that includes the Jewish possession of Jerusalem. Because God's promises, because of his promises, there is absolutely nothing unbiblical about having parts of the land of Israel, the ancestral homeland of the Jewish people, being declared as belonging to the state of Israel. This is biblical. Israel is a sovereign nation. Um, it goes on to say Israel is now important to uh, some of the Arab states in the fight against Iran. Iran in the 1970s became a extremist country, the Ayatollah Khomeini. He's like the head uh, iman or the head religious leader of Iran. Has restricted all rights for women in the sense of, and has declared war on America and Israel wants to become a nuclear nation so that they can bomb Israel to smithereens. So, um, recently, Israeli government has received immigration inquiries from more than a quarter of a million Jews from America, Australia, France, Germany, and other places. That's 250,000. It's called al Aliyah. I think about 50 to 60,000 Jews have been flooding into Israel every year. Perpetu perpetuity for decades. But this year especially, <laughs> with Ukraine... With this attack, people are just like done with all the anti-Semitism. They're like, I want to go home. Where are the lost tribes of Israel? Uh, and which tribes are currently in Israel today? Oh man, there's a lot of false, I don't know, Anglo-Saxons. There's some British Israelism. It's kind of weird that they teach um, that Anglo-Saxons are actually Jews, like Queen Elizabeth's related to the Jews and all this stuff. It's kind of weird. Uh, the Mormons believe that they... Descended from Ephraim and Manasseh. That's kind of a strange teaching. It's not biblical. Uh, but he knows exactly who's of what tribe. I have a friend who she believes she has her lineage all the way back to Sarah, which is phenomenal, but I don't know. It is what it is. But we should keep in mind that um, they weren't supposed to intermarry. One of the peculiarities of the Israeli people is they were to marry other people that were Jewish in custom and so there's a lot less variance and they can trace their genealogies better. But there's been a lot of dispersions or captivities where some of the genealogies were damaged. The Dead Sea Scrolls were quite amazing when we found uh, you know, Isaiah and hundreds or thousands of scrolls, but 99% accurate of what we have today. But genealogies, many times people would hide their, their Torahs, they would hide their genealogies, they would take this when they go captive to a foreign land. And many of them were destroyed. So what I do know is this. Uh, every tribe is named in Ezekiel 48. Um, as are the two of Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And specific geographic boundaries are listed in that chapter, which again requires every tribe's presence at that time. There is a yet future displacement or disbursement of land. During the time of Joshua, different tribes got different areas. If you remember Reuben... Manasseh, sorry, the half tribe of Manasseh and so Reuben and Simeon, that they decided to settle on the east side of the Jordan, which was a big no-no. They shouldn't have done that. But there was good fertile pasture land and they had their animals. They should have gone across the Jordan where they had natural protections. It was Dan, Ma uh, half tribe of Manasseh and Ru uh, Reuben, I think. But Dan and Reuben were the first to fall to the Assyrians because they didn't have that natural protection. So what I'm saying is there was land that was apportioned during Joshua's day. There will be land apportioned to the various tribes during the kingdom age, I believe. Um, God knows who his people are who are genetically related to Abraham, but it's not as important as being spiritually related to Abraham by faith in Jesus Christ. Do the blessings and curses of Genesis 12, 3 still apply today? I don't want to short circuit this, but <laughs> this is what Amir Sharfati says. Yes, God promised that through Abraham all the families of the earth would be blessed. And that's through his seed, Jesus Christ. That means the families today are still being blessed through Abraham. In what way? Through the one who came from Abraham's grandson, Jacob, who had 12 sons, including the one named Judah. Through the lineage of Judah, the tribe of the kings came the Messiah, Yeshua, 
who is still a blessing to people today. If the blessing part is still true, then the cursing part also has to be true. Remember Israel. The Jews are the chosen people of God, and the land was given to God's chosen people as an in, in eternal inheritance. Look at how God has brought his people back into the land. Isn't it amazing that Israel still even exists? Everybody hates them. And they've never started a war in the last 75 years. They didn't start it. They just want to mind their own business. Leave me alone. They defend themselves. They're not mercenaries. They're not going and being imperialistic and, and having a, an ambition to conquer other nations. He promised how he has protected them through many years uh, since they were attacked. Since 1948, the plans of Israel's enemies have been cursed. Think about all the nations recently. Think about what's going to happen to Hamas. I mean, all these pro-Palestinian people. It's not going to be good for them. On the very day they became, uh, de declared themselves to be a nation, they were attacked by five Arab nations with trained armies, guns, tanks, and planes. Their goal was to wipe Israel right out from the start. And what was the outcome of the war? Behold, Israel today, and you will see. The enemies who attacked did not prevail, nor did they in 1967, 1973. They could not prevail because those who curse Israel will themselves be cursed. Yes, Genesis 12, 3 is in effect today. Barry Stagner says, Amen. The key word is... And the promise is all, which is, as Amir pointed out, gives us the scope and duration of God's promise. In Genesis 12, 3, it declares, through Abraham, all families of the earth shall be blessed. When it comes to prophecy, the spirit of prophecy is the spirit of Jesus. Everyone can be blessed by putting their faith in Yeshua the Mashiach, or Jesus the Messiah, the King, the Son of God. What is meant by the day of the Lord? Is it a literal 24-hour period, or is it an era or season like the days of Noah? We can visit about that next time. There's another question. Some say the Jews are saved by keeping the law, and the Gentiles are saved by believing the gospel. Is this true? No one can be saved by keeping the law. You're saved through, through faith in Jesus Christ. So whenever we study prophecy, the emphasis is always pointing people back to, hey, put your faith in Jesus, and you won't have to worry about what's going on during the tribulation. If you're a believer, born again, you put all your faith, trust, and hope in Jesus, and you say, I need you, I want you, I love you, I'm allegiant to you, help me, I follow you, I give you my life, I trust you, I sign the line, I'm, I'm endorsing the check that you've given to me, I want to cash it, you know, I'm going to sign the contract, you fill in the blank, you've done that, you've made that clear, you pray that in your heart, you mean it. I'm not trying to complicate it, those are just all simple ways to basically describe, you trust him, you put all your faith, hope, and trust in him, then you will be raptured. You put your hope in him. He will rescue you. He knows how to rescue his own. He's not going to let you be appointed to wrath. You're not going to be punished. Jesus took your punishment. Will Israel play a role in the destruction of Damascus prophesied in Isaiah 17.11? That's the Damascus prophecy. Isaiah 17.11. That was right. I think it's Isaiah 19 is Egypt. Isaiah 17.11. Or 17.1. Sorry, 17.1. Damascus will be a heap of ruins in the last days. Damascus is mostly a heap of ruins but it's not completely destroyed. Do you think we'll see the building of the third temple? Do you think we'll get to see it? I don't think so. I think we'll be raptured before that. It's a good question. Those are just prophecies regarding Israel. This book, which is called Bible Prophecies, The Essentials, has a few chapters. Let me just tell you the titles. Israel, we have just kind of hit on them. I didn't go over the last three. The Church, The Rapture, The Tribulation, The Millennium, The Great White Throne of Judgment, Heaven, and additional pressing questions for today. They wrote this a few months ago, not even a year ago, and then Israel gets attacked with one of the most heinous attacks in the history of the nation. So, the significance of the relevance, you're thinking about what is the relevance of this Israeli conflict? It is unprecedented. Israel will never be the same. Uh, they are on heightened alert, and no one, I mean, U.S. is kind of a mixed bag. We're there to help, but not really, because we don't know how to help. Because we have mixed motives. We, I don't know what. Politicians say they support Israel. But we're in too deep with too much corruption it seems. I don't know. So what do we do with all this? If God can protect a nation that has been persecuted from their inception. God can protect you today. If God can deliver this peculiar people. He can deliver you. If God can protect and preserve his scriptures and the language. He can protect and preserve you. When people are anti-Jewish, then it's a curse. I mean, it, it, think about it. When people are anti-Christian, it's a curse. Like you're rejecting God's
plan and God's people. When you are rude to a fellow believer, when you are evil toward a believer, you're going to have to answer and God God knows what we do in secret and God will discipline those whom he loves. And we want to be, we want to do good to all, especially those of the household of faith. But in these days, when people are confused by what's going on in Israel, just point to them. Isn't it amazing that they even exist? Isn't it amazing that they even, they even stand? You can use this to say, hey, do you know about Jesus? He was a Jew. Do you know about Jesus? Uh, he prophesied that this would happen. Have you read Ezekiel? Just encourage your friends and your neighbors, your coworkers. Look, this was predicted. And we're yet to see things that the Bible, we're in Bible times. And, and we have exciting, uh, exciting good news to share. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the nation of Israel, the prophecies that have come true. Lord, we look forward to the reality that Jesus you're going to rescue us and take us from this world before it gets uh, to where there's a global uh, totalitarian uh, dictatorship where, where people will be persecuted and killed just for simply believing in you um, in mass scales. Lord, we know that there are people persecuted and killed all over the world today for faith in you, Jesus. We pray that you give us boldness, you give us urgency, but also humility and kindness and gentleness when we correct others and point them to you. Lord, we, we know that you are the answer, but we also know that you're the, the cure, the, the cancer that we have, you're the, the rescuer to our souls, and you can do that for others. Lord, equip us, give us boldness and kindness as we go out, schools, uh, workplaces, families, holidays, Lord, the conversations, may they be seasoned with grace. May we be ready to give a reason for the hope that we have. And point people to you, Jesus. We love you. We give you all the glory. And in your name we pray. Amen.